We're on board a Russian nuclear icebreaker bound for the North Pole. As a journalist, I've been to many dangerous places all around the world, but this trip definitely stands out. We're about to visit the least explored and accessible part of our planet. It gets only a thousand visitors a year because of its inhospitable environment and harsh climate. So buckle up, we're going all the way to the north. So we're departing from the city of Murmansk, uh, the home port of the uh, world's only nuclear icebreaker fleet. A lot of stuff around us is considered top secret, so technically I'm not even allowed to film here. But let's throw caution to the wind and check out this mighty giant behind me. It's an icebreaker called 50 Years of Victory that is going to take us to the North Pole. The icebreaker's main job is to guide tankers through Russia's frozen northern seas. But in the summer, when it's downtime, the ship carries tourists to the North Pole. Normally, a trip like this would cost up to $50,000, but this time the icebreaker is booked for Russian A-grade students who got tickets as a reward for their studies. So I guess you could say that these are uh, like the smartest kids in Russia, cream of the crop. We, the press, simply tagged along. The vessel is large and heavy. It takes two tugboats to pull it out from its moorings. And we're sailing off into the Arctic Ocean. So for the next 10 days, it's gonna be uh, ice, water, more ice, more water, and um, yeah, humming of the ship's nuclear reactors. The 50 Years of Victory was launched in 1993 and is the world's second largest nuclear icebreaker. It used to be number one until recently, but then the Arctica came along, which is even bigger and more powerful. Other countries also have icebreakers, but only Russia has them powered by atomic energy. This ship is huge. I mean, it's basically like a, uh, a multi-story building, an apartment complex, but placed on a ship, on a platform. Because of its size, I guess I keep losing sense of direction around here. So for instance, right now I'm uh, trying to find my cabin, but I have no idea where it is. The 50 years of victory boasts a gym, basketball court, restaurant, convention hall slash disco bar, and even a swimming pool filled with salty seawater. Technically, you can swim in the Arctic Ocean without leaving the icebreaker. So let's step into our cabin. So nothing fancy, but it has everything we need. We even found a couple of uh, SIG bags in one of the drawers. You know, a reminder of how rough it can get in the ocean. Uh, the room has well, look, it even has a humidifier. Look at this. And it also has a TV, but with only two channels. One shows you the route, and another one gives you the view from the ship's bow. So given the fact that there is no internet and mobile reception whatsoever, this is about all digital entertainment that you'll get on board. But you can always gaze in the window and enjoy soothing Arctic views. The icebreaker uses the energy of two nuclear reactors, which can power a small town if need be. They're operated from a control center that is vital to maintain the ship's safety. It's telling that the only books they keep on a shelf in the room are about radiation and how to detect it. As we walk around the ship, I see radiation signs. Does it mean I could be exposed to radiation? No. First of all, you're walking by rooms which have only limited access. In case there is an area where the radiation exceeds a safe level, a special alarm goes off, which notifies everyone. Then certain measures are taken. Truth be told, the reactors are safe. It is more likely you'll be blown overboard by strong winds than take a lethal dose of radiation on this ship. As soon as we're in the high seas, it's, the weather is changing rapidly and uh, it's getting 
cold and windy and we have to put on some winter clothes. It doesn't look like summer anymore. Now it's time to meet the captain. A tall, handsome man who likes to smoke his pipe on the bridge while steering the mighty vessel forward. It's a rudder, as I understand. You can effectively call the ship's wheel the rudder. And it has automatic steering, which holds the ship's course. So this is something like an autopilot, right? Not quite an autopilot. Autopilot is what keeps an aircraft in three dimensions, whereas on a ship it's just two. And if I turn the rudder, then… We'll set a new course. The vessel will turn and adjust to a new steady course. And this is what happens on a lower deck every time the captain adjusts the course. The helm sets these large pistons in motion, which turns the ship left or right. So we were on the bridge interviewing the captain, and we were lucky enough to sight our first Arctic iceberg. Let me show you this. Fact of the day, icebergs aren't 100% white. They have this beautiful turquoise shade. They also come in handy for local birds. It's an inhabitable iceberg, as I can tell. There are birds on it. Despite the fact they're seabirds which rest in the water, they use any surface that they find attractive. Be it an iceberg or a ship, they use it to take a rest. After two days of sailing, we reach Franz Josef Land, an uninhibited Arctic archipelago which belongs to Russia. This is the northernmost part of Russia and uh, the last piece of land on the way to the North Pole. So, in a sense, we're approaching the edge of the world. Now the most dangerous part of our journey begins. If something happens, it'll take days for someone to come rescue us. From now on, we can count only on ourselves and our captain. This is what it feels like uh, inside the ice breaker when it's plowing through the ice. Everything's trembling. You definitely can't miss it when the ship hits the ice. See these huge blades on the deck? Let's get a closer look. They are spare parts for propellers that are constantly working underneath the vessel. You might think that an icebreaker rams the ice, but it actually rides upon it first and then crushes downward with all its might. And that's when the propellers come into play. They help to chop the ice into small pieces, paving the way forward. Watching the ship break the ice and push giant chunks of it aside is mesmerizing. It's weirdly both calming and intimidating at the same time. Have a look at this. The wide path left by the icebreaker is closing up as soon as we pass through. In a few minutes, or maybe hours, it's all gonna be covered with ice again as if we've never been here. Shows you who the boss is around here and uh, I guess makes you feel small and insignificant. Parts of the ship start to cover with ice as we get closer to the North Pole. However, the temperature isn't extreme, just under zero degrees Celsius. Unlike me, a veteran polar explorer who we interviewed on the deck even refused to put his hat on. It's a common misconception that the North Pole is the coldest spot on the Earth. It's completely false. The North Pole is the middle of an ocean. The ocean is a kind of heat storage, as it allows temperature spikes. Frequently at the North Pole, it's warmer than, let's say, in Chitanga or Oymekon or Verhoyansk. It means the pole of cold does not coincide with an actual geographical one. Viktor Bayarsky has taken several dozen expeditions to the North Pole. Global warming, he says, is taking its toll on the Arctic, and the ice becomes thinner every year. However, he doesn't believe man-made CO2 emissions are to blame for everything. I share the same viewpoint as our scientists, who also think that this process is not irreversible in its nature. The anthropogenic factor is the main one. What it means is that, imagine for a second we all switch to green energy and stop producing CO2 into the atmosphere. 
all the factories are closed and you think this will suddenly stop. No, it won't. On the third day, we saw our first polar bear. He was taking a nap on an ice floe before we woke him up. The bear gave us a grumpy look, walked away and tried to fall asleep again. Well, don't be fooled by his adorable looks. These are deadly wild animals that are notorious for attacking humans. And uh, you see, life in the Arctic is no picnic and food is in short supply for these animals. And a polar bear will go after anything that's moving if it's dinner time, even for you. Speaking of dinner, food on the icebreaker was amazing. Unlike pioneers of Arctic exploration, we didn't have to worry about our next meal. Normally, we're not supposed to be here, but nevertheless, we were granted a rare uh, visit to uh, the part of the ship that smells the best, the kitchen. When you fly on a plane, I always crave a tomato juice. Is there a product or a dish that you crave as much when on the icebreaker? As for food, fruit and vegetables are a sore point for us. Sometimes you're in the Arctic for three to four months and no one has come up with a way to keep them fresh for such a long time. So usually they're gone within a month and then you find yourself longing for some cucumber, tomato or an apple or pear. What a lot of people on this ship really missed is good sleep. It's midnight, but look how bright it is. It's really hard to adjust to the polar day and a lot of passengers, including myself, are having a hard time falling asleep. You see, the sun rises and sets just once per year in the Arctic, which makes time of day an irrelevant concept here. And that goes to the time itself, by the way, but we'll get to that at the North Pole. On the fifth day, all eyes were on GPS coordinates as everyone's waiting to finally reach 90 degrees north. The first people to disembark were the hunters, whose job was to scare off polar bears if they show up. Our crew went out right after that. Okay, here we go. I'm setting my foot at the most northern part of our planet. How does it feel? Well, it feels like I just landed on another planet. From here, every direction you look is south. There is nobody above us. We are literally on top of the world. I don't know. Let me say it again. We are on top of the world! Now this is where it gets mind-blowing. If you want to know what time it is at the North Pole, it's basically whatever you like it to be. Look at this watermelon, which I, by the way, brought all the way from the mainland to show you this. All of its tribes are coming together at the top, or at the bottom, just like Earth's longitudes, which determine time on the planet. So, at the North or South Pole, it's all the time zones, and none of them at the same time. No time, no other people, just a boundless frozen desert. It was the most surreal experience of my life. Well, until this happened. Now that I'm a big fan of uh, swimming in the icy water, but it's the North Pole after all, and only a handful of people made it here, even less, had to swim on top of the world. So, I'm going in. What's magical in this place for me personally is that you exist here within one dimension with the world around. You encase time with the rhythms of all the people all your close ones, friends, relatives who are scattered in different parts of the world. Nevertheless, in this place, it's as if you're in one dimension with them all. It's necessary for a person to have some alone time. So one could look at how he lived, what he's done, was it right or wrong? This place is predisposed for that.
Konstantin Rushkov reporting for RT from the North Pole.